All right, thanks so much. It's always a pleasure to be in Las Vegas, and um, I'll let these guys take the chairs out. So before I start, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story, because I always talk about my son, Alexander. So Alexander is 15, and uh, he's my version of Dennis the Menace. So if you, you and, and, and lo and behold, he's, he's a computer guy, right? He's always getting himself into trouble. So a number of years ago, I, uh, I took the family to Europe. I was working uh, a couple weeks in Europe, and uh, I think it was one of those trips where my wife always thought that it was glamorous of all the cities I've been to. And then we went on a work trip, and we were in like five cities in a day. And I think she figured out it wasn't so glamorous. But um, we did have a little time in Paris. And when I showed up in Paris, I took the kids around. And uh, of course, we went to the Eiffel Tower, and it was raining. And we sort of get up to the Eiffel Tower, and my son looks around, and he's looking at it, and he goes, Dad, this is incredible. This tower is unbelievable. I'm so happy you took us here. It looks like the one that they built in Las Vegas. And I'm like, OK, Alexander, you need a little bit more international exposure. So um, it's, it's good to be in Vegas, and uh, it's always uh, a fun time, particularly around Black Hat. So my talk is really focused around the business of security and uh, making sure people understand what it means to be in security. So I'm going to make this a little bit interactive. You've got to help me out. I'm going to ask a few questions as we go through this. So show of hands. How many people are actually in security? OK. And for the others, you're all wrong, because you're all in the business of security. So I'm going to ask that question at the end of the presentation, and uh, we'll see if we made some progress. So let's go through the key concepts. Uh, one of the things that I like to talk about is the current landscape and the threat environment. We're um, in a unique position to see a lot of the threats. Uh, we've been involved in a lot of the breaches, as you, you, you probably heard. And the threat landscape is continually changing. And one of the areas that I think people just don't have a good appreciation for is just how sophisticated the adversary is, what they're doing, how they're doing it, and what they're going after. We're then going to transition to security and how it's evolved. And I've been fortunate enough to, uh, I, I lucked into security uh, in, in 1993 when I was working uh, at Price Waterhouse. I got into their consulting group and, and started there as the fifth person. Uh, in their entire security practice, and uh, didn't know much back then, kind of figured it out, and that's how I, I wrote the, uh, the Hacking Exposed book. But from where it evolved to where it is today is much different, and we'll talk through some of those uh, topics. And then I want to finish with uh, the business of security and how you should be thinking about security, um, why everyone needs to take ownership, and, and not only as an executive level, but dealing with boards of directors, dealing with um, a lot of complexity that's out there, regulators, and making sure that even if you don't think you're in security because your title doesn't say you actually are. So let's look at uh, today's uh, landscape and uh, talk about some of the changes. So if we think about most organizations, most companies, uh, they've gone out and they bought firewalls and they bought antivirus software and they bought sandbox and they bought tons of products that you know, may or may not all work together. And I think they have this sort of, well, first they're overloaded with all of the security products that they buy, but two, they have this false sense of security that you know, there is no chaos, right? Um, the things are, are protected behind the scenes. If you're in the trenches, you know that you know, there's a difference. There's a lot of chaos. But what people don't necessarily understand is that while it may look calm at this level, the house is on fire, right? And that's really what we're seeing behind the scenes is the adversary is so persistent, they're so good in many ways, and in many ways they're very sloppy, but the bar is so low that they're able to get into organizations, and the reality can be deceiving. And this is one of the areas where um, I do a lot of work at the board level. When I, when I speak to board members, um, unfortunately there's not a lot of IT experience at a Fortune 500 company. Um, a lot of the board members are financial people, or they're engineers, or they're you know, sales execs that rose to the ranks. Um, in any event, they don't necessarily have a, a true understanding of what's happening, and they ask simple questions like, you know, are we secure? Do we have a firewall? Do we have antivirus? And years ago, that used to be okay. You'd get two thumbs up from the CIO. Um, but just think about that today uh, in how a board might ask a CFO about the financial numbers. They wouldn't get two thumbs up or okay, right? They have third-party audits, and they have a lot more rigor around it. So there's a lot of chaos, particularly at the business and the management level, um, and really understanding what's happening here. And part of your job is to help educate not only people within your organization from a business perspective, but senior management. And if you're fortunate or unfortunate enough to, to be in, invited to the board meeting, you've got to uh, educate some of the folks there. 
I love this slide. Uh, it reminds me of, of uh, I guess, my childhood, reading all those <laughs> mad magazines. Uh, but it's time to really think about security and, and how it's changed. So this slide really depicts the fact that in many years ago, um, when we think about the adversary and we think about nation states, it was all about nation state versus, versus nation state. Um, it was, you know, U.S. versus Russia or China or, you know, I mean, it goes on and on, right? I mean, we've had so many different adversaries that are out there. And the thing that is interesting is that they didn't necessarily cross the lines between state on state, right? And if you look at what happened over the last, say, 10 years, particularly with China, they actually crossed that line and it's really state against corporation. And that's, that's a very uh, big deal if you think about the history of security and what companies have to deal with. You never had to worry about necessarily, uh, maybe if you were you know, Boeing or something like that, you'd have to worry about espionage. But in general, you weren't worried about a nation state with all of its capabilities and all of its resources bringing that to bear against your corporation. Um, and that's really what we're seeing now. We've seen the shift from st state versus state to uh, nation state versus corporation. This is a great example. You've got the uh, F-22 up here and you've got the J-20 uh, fighter from China. Anybody know the difference? You might be able to tell some of the logos on there, but the plane on the right is actually the F-22. There's striking similarities between the two because this is one of the most notable cases of IP theft that's publicly available. And the plans, um, the engineering documents, a lot of the know-how and the billions of dollars that were spent on developing this joint strike fighter, uh, the F-22, were actually stolen and then lo and behold copied by China. And you can see the, uh, the similarities. This is just one glaring example. I'll give you another, another real world example. And, and I was in the back listening to the panel. I know there was a panelist from a biotech firm. So I'll tell you a biotech story. Uh, CrowdStrike got called into uh, a company biotech company and they said, hey, we, we think we have a problem. We're not sure, but we think we have a problem. So he said, okay, well, what's the problem? They said, well, we, we, it took five years to develop this biotech uh, um, kind of formula that we have and we found out that someone actually is trying to knock it off. They have a copy of it. They said, okay, well, tell us what happened. So the story goes, there's only one place in China that actually manufactures this particular uh, technology. It was a, kind of a formula. And someone actually went to that place with an exact copy of the formula uh, and actually tried to have that manufacturer create it for them. So they got lucky in that the manufacturer in China actually called the company and said, hey, um, this kind of looks familiar to what we make over here, and you're the only guys that make it. You've got the patent on it. So what do you think? So they called us in. We did the investigation. Of course, we found an extensive intrusion by China, lots of data exfiltration, and literally what took five years to develop and millions and millions of dollars of IP literally stolen and another company was able to copy it. They were able to deal with that particular incident, but obviously the formula was out and they were able to get that copied within a span of a year. So huge dollars at stake and um, we realize what some of the consequences are. So this is North Korea. We've got lots of missiles. Some missiles work, some don't, right? We <laughs> always see the uh, cartoons of missiles going up and. You know, sometimes they work or they sputter out. But who's paying for all this stuff, right? There's not a lot of industry in North Korea. There's not a lot of trade that happens. You know, everybody, there's only a couple places that they, they have trading uh, relationships with. Well, North Korea, in part, has gotten into uh, the game of funding some of their activities with cybercrime, ransomware, and things of that nature. So now you're actually seeing nation states um, involved in some fashion in the cybercrime business. And this happens even outside of North Korea where you have folks that are maybe work for a government but also moonlight as cyber criminals. And the government basically allows that to happen given the, the participation that they're providing to that particular government. That happens a bit in Russia. Uh, so it's, a, it's an amazing uh, change of events over the last number of years that we've seen. Tampering with the democratic process. Where do I start on this one? Um, well, there's always something new that comes out of Washington, and I have to say, um, you know, when I started CrowdStrike in 2011, I didn't think uh, we'd be part of kind of history of how everything went down. 
as was mentioned earlier, um, you know, we were the guys that got called in to do the investigation. Uh, it was just the forensic work, and uh, we associated that. Uh, a lot of the technology and the techniques were associated back with Russia, and that was validated by 17 other intel agencies. Uh, and there's a whole debate of uh, whether it influenced the election or not. I, that's not for me to decide. What's important, though, is that we're seeing, again, state actors that are focused on using cyber against not only just corporations, not just stealing government information, but actually trying to influence the outcome of an election, right? And it was, it was apparent. It was apparent here, and it was actually apparent in, uh, in what happened in France, right? So this is a, you know, a watershed event. We were involved um, just because we did the investigation. And I guess at some point, I'll, I'll be able to tell my grandkids that, you know, we were part of this circus that happened you know, um, as everything went down. So I didn't realize that security would come this far when I got into it in 93. And in the early days of security, I got a, uh, I got a lesson from, um, uh, uh, you know, it was when I first started, I was doing a security review and there was a, a system administrator uh, for a big uh, brewery and we were doing some pen testing and uh, they said, you see that vat over there? And I said, yeah, I see it. And they said, that vat is really important. It makes our beer. I go, I got it. And they said, that VAT actually has a computer attached to it. And the computer, by the way, was SunOS 413. And if you ever worked on any of those, you realize you might as well just give out the root password, right? So um, they said, this is critical to us. And I said, I got it. It makes your beer. And they said, no, we don't. The beer is one thing. You see that guy in the corner? I said, yeah. Well, that guy in the corner goes into that VAT every night and cleans it out. And it was massive. It was like huge, right? And they said, if that process controller turns on and the guy drowns, it's a disaster. So that was my first um, realization that it wasn't just having your computer infected and having your hard drive uh, wiped out or your, you know, at the time floppies infected or what have you. It really was a life or death situation. So now you kind of fast forward many years and then you look at this and it was again something that I had never anticipated that not only security would move from sort of this fun thing in the basement of creating viruses to potentially uh, impacting people's lives to the, 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 the next area, which is really impacting society uh, and the electoral process. So I do think it's a big deal and, um, you know, something that we'll continue to monitor as we go forward. Let's talk about the trickle-down effect. So I got a picture of Velcro up here. And the interesting thing about Velcro, it wasn't quite developed by NASA. It was actually developed by somebody else. but. Uh, it was kind of cloth, and it was more perfected by NASA. But I use this as an example of the trickle-down effect. And you can look at many things that have actually trickled down, either from military government or even in the automotive industry, where they started at a much higher level, very expensive R&D that went into it, and now it's, it's common practice to be able to use things like Velcro. It's on my kids' shoes. It's on everything, right? Of the first incarnations where expensive is only used for space. And the reason why I talk about this, uh, well, I'll use another example, even in the car industry. I'm a, I'm a big car guy, I love Formula One and racing and things of that nature. If you look at anti-lock brakes and a lot of the technologies, they were all developed, super expensive, and now it's on every car that you can possibly buy. So when we look at the trickle-down effect, it's really taking a view of what happened in the government space and the techniques and the tools that were used and looking at those and, and just looking at how, the, how quickly they've actually transferred and trickled down into e-crime and the criminals. And people who have no idea actually how to build these very sophisticated tools now have access to those tools. And that's really the scary part is because a lot of them are super sophisticated. We'll talk about them in a minute. Uh, and this has trickled down. So I think the best example of this is WannaCry. Did anybody lose their weekend to WannaCry? Show of hands, anybody? Oh, you guys are lazy. I'm surprised. Well, maybe, maybe Trace3 has got you hooked up with some good technology. So, um, so WannaCry is a great example of technology that was developed out of the government that got repurposed for other purposes or e-crime, ransomware in this particular case. So if you look at the story alleged that the NSA had a data leak and that data leak contained information about uh, some implants and some vulnerabilities um, that were used for many years to gain access to these systems. And once the data was leaked, uh, the adversary was able to look at that particular exploit and then basically incorporate that into some old 
ransomware that they had. Now the scary part about this, and, and you'll get it when I go through it, is that there wasn't a lot of sophistication in it. They literally kind of took the code and plugged it in. And it's equivalent to getting some plutonium and just sticking it in a suitcase. It's like you don't know how to make the plutonium, but you can sure do a lot of destruction with it, right? And make a dirty bomb out of it. And that's really what we saw with uh, WannaCry. Um, we are seeing a lot of the techniques that originated out of the government, implants, sophisticated backdoors, covert channels, tunneling, a lot of the things that the uh, kind of the unsophisticated, unsophisticated adversary wasn't able to do is now available on the black market, is now, you know, honestly, a 15-year-old kid can download some of this stuff, and he had more exploit power than we had five years ago, like by a factor of 10. I mean, it's crazy what you can do on the open market. And this is where it gets scary. If we think about e-crime and how big this is, it's a multi-billion dollar business. Um, some equate it to a business that's larger than the drug trade. But e-crime is actually a corporate endeavor. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if we think about uh, some of the ransomware that's come out, I'm going to ask another question, and uh, I'll kind of get to the point here. But how many folks have actually legitimately bought Bitcoin? Do you know how to do it? OK. You're a CrowdStrike guy. You know how to do that. So um, not a lot of people have actually bought Bitcoin, or no, nor would they know actually how to do it. So guess what happens when you get infected? You get a little note that says, you're infected and you have to pay in Bitcoin. So I want to get my data back, but I have no idea how to pay in Bitcoin. Well, the bad guys are actually nice enough to support you and provide help desk support. I got one line, I got like a few guys doing help desk support. These got a team of multi-language uh, experts that are supporting this effort. So if you don't, you know, speak Russian or you don't speak English or you don't speak Indian, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. They can actually support you in multiple languages. They literally have four or five hundred people, help desk, HR teams, onboarding, you know, they have offices. A lot of them originate out of Russia and uh, kind of Eastern Bloc countries, but e-crime is a big business. It is amazing to see just how effective it is. And the fact that they actually have a call center um, with videos, I mean, sometimes it's better than the commercial support you get. I mean, they're very, they're very helpful about it. So um, it's just amazing what you can do with a little ingenuity. So let's talk about data as a weapon and data dumps. Uh, and we've seen data dumps, whether it's Sony, the DNC, whether it's shadow brokers with some of the NSA tools. And I would hazard a guess if I ask most companies here, you know, what's your, what's your biggest asset? And I do that all the time, and companies come back and I say, well, our intellectual property is our biggest asset. We've got all the data on this, and we've got data here, and we've got data there, and we don't manufacture everything, but data is just everywhere in our organization, and that's our biggest asset. And I normally tell them, well, that's also your biggest liability. Your biggest asset is your biggest liability, which is what I call the security paradox. And that is, with all the data that you have floating around, whether it's in a mainframe, whether it's in a, um, a server that's sitting where, whether it's in a cloud, or generally, if it's all you know, structured data that's now unstructured sitting in an Excel spreadsheet, it's available and it can be used as a weapon. And we've seen that time and time again, particularly over the last couple of years, of how effective it can be. Um, so my point on this is really to understand the data that you have, how you're protecting it, how you're classifying it, and to realize that the more data you create, it does accrue intellectual property and value, but it also exposes your organization to these sort of data as a weapon type attacks. So let's talk about Security Evolved and the fundamental changes in the landscape of security. All right, so poor Aaron Moran. Uh, we used to watch Happy Days all the time as a kid. So let's talk about the good old days of malware. And I remember, um, gosh, in the late 80s, early 90s, I used to have to download McAfee over a bulletin board. There's probably a few old timers out there that remember that. I used to put it on a floppy. I'd get the signature updates. Uh, you know, every month or something, and life was good. Life's not so good anymore, right? That's kind of the, the old days. You know, the original virus that came out was a brain virus. It was written by 
two guys that had some software and the software was being pirated and they wanted to make sure that this pirated software wasn't being used and they, were, they created this virus and that kind of kicked off the whole industry. And at the time in the early 90s, it was you know, maybe a couple thousand samples uh, every couple of weeks. I mean, it, there weren't a lot of samples that are out there. And if you look at today and you fast forward to malware and how sophisticated it is, um, there's about 300,000 samples of malware every day that come in that need to be processed. 300,000 samples. So it's very difficult to deal with all that malware and to do that um, in any manual type fashion. And in the old days, um, in the antivirus world, you used to get the malware and you'd have a researcher sit down with a cup of coffee and they'd pull up a debugger and they'd start looking at it and then they'd create a signature and they'd go on their way. Well, um, obviously we can't do that today given how sophisticated threats are and how fast they're coming. The other thing that I will say is the malware of yesteryear was pretty easy to detect. If you look at what happens today in the sophistication level, and if you take any government um, implant, which is what they're called, it's part of a whole toolkit, they're, they're extremely sophisticated, extremely stealthy, and the hard part is once they get into an organization, they'll actually remove the implant so it has less probability of being captured by the company, uh, the adversary uh, that they're working against, or even the security industry. Um, so it's hard to keep up with all these samples, and um, you know, those days are long gone. Now, when we talk about malware, I always talk about the digital bullet concept. And over the last 30 years, almost every security company and, and organization is really focused on what I call the digital bullet, right? And that is the malware itself. So if I gave you the scenario of, you know, you're at gunpoint, somebody's shooting at you, I guarantee you, you are not gonna ask what caliber bullet is that? Is that a nine millimeter? Is that a 45? Like, you don't really care, right? It's a bullet that's coming after you. What you wanna do is actually protect yourself, right? Get to cover, and then you're gonna ask, like, who is that and why are they shooting at me? But no one is really asking those questions in the security space. The only thing we do is we keep looking at digital bullets, which is the malware, and we keep trying to come up with other signatures to deal with that. And you really have to look at who's behind it what are they after to be able to better protect yourself, right? So if you know who's trying to shoot you or harm you or get in your organization, you're gonna be much better prepared from a risk perspective to try to deal with that threat, knowing that you can't deal with every threat that's out there. So this whole concept of just looking at the bullets uh, is the reason why when WannaCry comes out, you have mass hysteria because everybody's looking at the bullet, not understanding what the actor's doing, how they're doing it, and more importantly, dealing with sort of the the whole kill chain as opposed to just a single bullet or a piece of malware. Now this is a Verizon stat. 51% of the breaches that you read about are actually use malware, which is probably a surprising stat for a lot of the folks in the audience, because you kind of think, well, you know, if we just dealt with all the malware, we would get rid of all these breaches. Reality is no. So 49% of the breaches obviously don't use malware. Why is that? What do they use? Well. Things like social engineering, things like uh, insider threat, things like credential theft, these are all non-malware related attacks. And you see those all the time. I got a good one yesterday from, from Facebook. Uh, it was like somebody's trying to log into your account from Russia. And I'm like, well, okay, you know, let's look at that. So we looked at it and you know, it was just another spam. But um, the idea is you know, giving up the credentials, and then logging in, no malware is actually used, but a lot of the breaches and a lot of the data dumps have come from this, this theft. So as you look across the spectrum, whether it's hacktivism, e-crime, or nation state, as you go up the spectrum of sophistication, you're starting to see less and less malware, right? People are getting better at detecting malware, sandboxes, et cetera, uh, and you're starting to see these techniques of living off the land. And if you're involved in security, if you're in IT somewhere, you realize that when somebody gets in your organization, the first thing they do is they dump the credentials, they, they crack the passwords, and they move laterally, and they blend in like an average user. There's no malware related to that, uh, which is part of the problem. So this is where I said I need some audience participation. I need to take a little bit of a survey, because we did one, and I'll give you the results. So uh, I'm going to ask two questions. What's more important, um, stopping malware or stopping a breach? So I need a show of hands. What's more important, stopping malware? One, OK. More important, stopping a breach. All right, there you go. So I think the room has it nailed because 
you know, as I just went through, if you're focused on just stopping malware, you're going to lose 49% of the time. I don't really like those odds. We're in Vegas. Those are house odds, right? You know, you're going to lose. So we did a survey at CrowdStrike, and we surveyed, I think, 300 companies of 1,000 users or more, a lot of them in the 10,000 user range, and we did the survey, and a third of the respondents and the executives said um, stopping malware was more important. Right, so there's a lot of education that has to happen out there, and it's one of those areas where people are just kind of in that mindset of, well, if I just stop the malware, I'm going to be safe. You're not. So in the business of keeping your company safe and, and putting your security hat on, you have to realize that there's much more to the puzzle than just stopping malware. When we think about cybercrime, cybercrime used to be localized, right? Used to have your neighborhood pickpocket and your mugger, and they worked the street corner, and the cops drove around, right? And they knew who the bad guys were. They would put them in jail. They'd get out of jail. You know the drill, right? The old method uh, that criminals use is no longer in play. Yeah, you have some of those that are out there, right? You're always going to have that. But why would you risk pickpocketing or mugging somebody when I can go steal 100 million credit cards at the click of a button? And by the way, probably not get caught and make you know, exponentially more money. So the cyber criminals are actually using these new techniques, but why are we still using the old police car trying to drive around and find these guys, right? It really isn't effective. And they are leveraging the power of the cloud. They are leveraging the power of scale in the internet to be able to uh, perpetrate these crimes, um, but law enforcement and a lot of our defenses haven't necessarily caught up. So I want to talk about two game changers when we think about combating cybercrime, the adversary, and uh, just bolstering our security. Number one is the cloud, and number two is artificial intelligence. So let's jump into that. So let me give you the example here. And the question is a little hard to read there. But the question is, is the bank being robbed? So I'm going to go through a scenario. So you have this bad guy that walks around the bank, kind of checks the entry, enters the bank, puts a disguise on, avoids the camera, opens the vault, takes the money out, leaves with the money, and gets into the, to the car and drives away. Now, I've never seen this person before. I don't know if they're good or bad. They're not on the FBI's most wanted list, right? When we check the license plate, it isn't on the known bad signature list, right? It's the activity of something they're performing. So what we need to do is we need to define what bad actions are, and then we need to understand that I don't need a signature to be able to find the bad guy, right? I don't need the bad guy to be on the most wanted list. I just need to look at what the bad guy's doing, and I can tell you here that the bank's being robbed. There's only a few ways to rob a bank, folks. You got to get the money, you got to get out. So whether you're tall, small, uh, male, female, doesn't matter. Black car, blue car, uh, if you're in there getting the money and getting out, that's probably a bad activity. So how does that apply in security? Well, I'm going to let you guys play security practitioners because you're in the business of security. So if we think about a process that runs and enumerates a file system and deletes the backup and then calls an encryption routine, folks, what kind of malware do we think this is? Ransomware, right? Did I need a signature to tell you it was ransomware? I just looked at what happened, right? And I linked all of these process flows together. And that's really the future of security, right? It's this combination of cloud at scale. The bad guys are using the cloud. They're doing it at scale. And the internet and graph technology. Now, if you're not familiar with graph technology, you use it every day. If you do a search on Google, Bing, if you use LinkedIn, if you use Facebook, it is all powered by graph technology. Now, what does that mean? It means that there's lots of unstructured data in the world. And unfortunately, everybody's been trying to put it into a structured format, like a relational database. That's not great for security, because you have a lot of these outliers, and you really don't know the relationships between all of these different events that happen, and you can't do that in a relational database. So you need graph technology that actually allows you to take billions of discrete events and put those together, and then actually look at the picture, and you can see the red ransomware that shows in, in a sea of events that are out there. So these are two very important um, uh, technologies that are really driving security innovation. Now, when we talk about the cloud, I always like to give two examples here. And I think this will il illustrate why the cloud is so important when we think about security. 
So we have Siebel, founded in 93, fastest growing company in 99, client server era, dominated CRM, 45% market share. Anybody used to run Siebel, right? Need an army of people to make it all run. They closed proprietary and sold to Oracle for $5.8 billion. Well, I'm going to look at Salesforce, founded in 99. They're all cloud-based. They have a platform, an open ecosystem. Data can be reused. And they got only have 20% market share, but their market cap is $64 billion. Now, why do I say that? I go through this example because the security vendors of the past may not be the security vendors of the future, right? Siebel never made the transition. And if we believe that cloud is the future of security, which I do, uh, you need to think about embracing that and working with organizations that will be around uh, and can make that transition. You know, a lot of smart folks didn't make the transition into new architectures. Does anybody know um, who painted this? Rembrandt, right. But he painted it after he died. Now, how can that be? Well, this is the third wave of AI. So basically, researchers categorized every feature that they could of a Rembrandt painting, of all of his paintings, and all the characteristics, and came up with an algorithm that actually allowed them to create another Rembrandt. The eyes, the features, the hair, how the, it's a portrait. This was literally created on a computer based upon all of the past Rembrandt paintings that were out there. It's incredible. You can go Google this and um, you'll see, I mean, what they did is amazing. So the power of AI is available today. It's available in security. And we've moved from, I call it the third wave. The first two waves were, hey, we got AI and it's gonna you know, be robots and do everything. Uh, that's not really gonna work. You need to put AI to use where it's best served. Taking a lot of data, looking for similarities and traits, and then being able to train the system to understand the differences and be able to pull out what a human can never do with millions of different discrete events. And this is a good example of where we are today. So people have figured out how to use AI, particularly in security, uh, very effectively from a malware and, an, and a detection perspective. So how is AI predictive? This is actually a graph, red and blue. And it's a simple one, but it's kind of what we do at, at uh, CrowdStrike when we look at malware, is we're able to look at millions and millions of different features, and we're able to plot those uh, using AI and then figure out what's good or bad. This is a yes or no, a good or bad. This is a great example. This is three features to determine whether someone's physical appearance is male or female. Okay, it's the wrist, it's the Adam's apple, and it is the hand circumference. That's it, three features, and you can basically, with 99% accuracy, determine whether somebody's male or female. Now, this is a simple example, but we're applying uh, many more sophisticated algorithms like this using AI to tell you whether something's good or bad. So let's talk about the business of security and the things that everybody needs to kind of think about. Number one is embracing the cloud. Right, I remember in 2011 um, when I, I started uh, CrowdStrike, which is, which is cloud-based, but I, I would walk into a lot of customers, particularly the big banks, right? Uh, big banks out of uh, Switzerland or even the big banks in the US, and we talk about cloud and security and why it was so important, why we, they need to make the transition. And you know what they would say? We don't do the cloud. We're, not, we're never gonna do the cloud. We don't, think it's, we don't want to send our data to the cloud or whatever excuse they had. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. If I recall, because I was, you know, I knew all these guys and gals, um, weren't you the same bank that said you were never going to virtualize your data center? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How'd that work out? Well, yeah, everything's virtualized. Now, weren't you the same bank that actually said we're never going to go Microsoft in our data center? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, Linux. We're never going to do Linux in the data center. Yeah, 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 that was us. But you have Linux everywhere and you're gonna be the same bank who actually uses the cloud. So fast forward to 2018, there's huge Swiss banks, everybody's Office 365, security, I mean, it's all over the place. Hardest part is dealing with some of the you know, compliance issues, but other than that, um, I think people are, are there. So embracing the cloud security, why? Well, if you're, if you're gonna depend on the police car to track down 
the cyber criminal who's stealing 100 million credit cards, it's not going to work, right? You have to do it at the speed of the cloud. Number two is leveraging threat intelligence. Now, why is threat intelligence important? Well, it's important because it gives you an idea of what the adversary is trying to do, how to stop them. If you went into the battlefield and you just showed up and said, all right, we're here, and you had no idea who your adversary was, you had no idea whether they're bringing bayonets or bazookas to the gunfight, you're going to get killed. Right, so understanding threat intelligence is really important. Not that you're going to go after these folks, but it helps tell the story because why you are in the business of security. So when you talk to a business owner about security, they don't care about bits, bytes, registry settings, and stupid names like want to cry. What they care about is downtime, you know, cash in, cash out, and going to jail. And you have to be able to put it into terms of why this adversary is focused on your company, what they're trying to do, more importantly, how you're going to try to stop them. The third one is really hunting for the adversary. And this is, um, this is actually a big one that I'm really passionate about. Any company is going to have an incident. There's no security on the product a planet that will you know, prevent every incident from happening. You're going to have an insider, whatever it might be, there will be some incident. What you want to do is you want to make sure that that incident doesn't turn into a breach. It doesn't turn into a breach. And to do that, you need to be able to hunt on your network. Now, what does that mean? It means that you need people, insourced or outsourced, doesn't really matter, that are constantly looking for breach indicators. So that instead of having somebody on your network for 200 days that you never knew about, you know, they might be there for a couple of minutes. But there's no data theft, there's no data destruction and you don't have a reportable breach incident. So this whole concept of, of threat hunting is very important. And again, being in the business of security, you kind of need to know about these things. Five other things that you need to consider um, around your security programs are things like hygiene, IT hygiene. Where are my assets? What assets do I have? I would guess, it, I won't even ask the question to have somebody tell me if they knew every asset in their organization, because they'd probably be lying, unless it was like their home computer or something like that, right? Big companies just don't know what they have. They don't know what applications are running. You ask, and, and again, maybe in your own organization, you may have seen this over the weekend, are we vulnerable to want to cry? What systems are not patched? It's a disaster, nobody knows. So having the ability to understand what's in your environment, what assets are there, what applications are running, optimize your licenses, what have you, that's important. Um, the AV piece, I want you guys to think about uh, moving away from signatures, right? So signatures, uh, we saw they didn't work, right? Uh, WannaCry is a good example. Everybody got blasted because they weren't able to kind of use things like artificial intelligence to kind of deal with some of these more sophisticated attacks. Third one is really that visibility, right? What's happening in your environment, whether it's your endpoint or your network? What's happening there and how do I understand if something bad happens, I can go back in time you know, obviously you want to stop it beforehand, but if you ever needed to kind of recreate or get in or determine whether something was reportable or deal with an insider, you want that visibility. I talked a little bit about threat hunting, how important it is, and threat intelligence. Um, so with that, I will get wrapped up and say it's been a real pleasure. Uh, thank you to Trace3, who is a fantastic partner of ours and all the people involved in Trace3. So um, I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to talk to this group. I hope you got something out of it and uh, you know, we're a little bit more educated than maybe you started, at least a, a nugget of truth. And I have to ask the question now, how many folks are in the business of security, right? When everybody's hands up. All right, so thank you so much. I hope to see you soon and uh, be secure.